It is almost about time, everybody, and thank you uh, for joining us again for another uh, fantastic uh, monthly IPASC webinar, this time organized, co-organized with the Korean Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. Um, and, and it's a delight to, to be now this time visiting Korea and our uh, esteemed colleagues here. Uh, we have a very busy and, um, and a fantastic talk. It's a common uh, topic, the intermittent exotropia. And uh, we will have a, a, a list of amazing speakers talking different aspects of it. Uh, with that, I would like to quickly, as always, give you an update on IPOSC. As you know that IPOSC, the International Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Council, um, has, has 90 member uh, society um, and, and it, it representing more than 20,000 individuals. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge, as always, our past presidents for all their um, um, help and, and work uh, to allow us to get to this point. Um, uh, the current board of directors, um, as you know, is, is, um, is uh, I just want to kind of share that as a list and, and our advisory board and the members as well. Um, just to go very quickly over the committees and chairs, we do have many committees. And um, so the uh, probably the most active aside from the International Training and Education Committee as is, is leading this um, um, webinar um, chaired by Dr. Jason Yam and, and also uh, with the help of Dr. Sonal Farzavandi and, and, and Sati Agagulian from Russia, um, which they do a phenomenal job. Um, the ROP committee uh, led by Paul Chen and maybe quickly mention about international pediatric eye care training as uh, under the leadership of Stephen Christensen from USA and, and Cindy Pritchard, um, they have done their first visit and we're uh, gearing up towards starting our first uh, training um, site in Gambia in Africa. Uh, the research team has been, or committee has been very, very busy. And now there is this um, big, big um, um, get together under the vision screening and, and under the uh, leadership of Melissa Peterstein, again from USA, um, a, a, we're going to, you're going to hear quite a bit about uh, the efforts in vision screening. So if you ever um, would like to join these efforts, uh, please reach out to the chairs um, so they can um, have, you, have you help. Again, just a little update, the ROP committee and these subsections as we all know, the international classification of ROP has been published. Um, and again, it, this was an IPOSC initiative um, that um, experts uh, from six continents got together to, to, to um, outline the next classification. And the CEBA committee um, now has uh, finalized the visits um, to the Africa, the three sites, uh, four cities, and that, that uh, now the, the training and um, the, all the efforts will, will begin. With that, I would like to thank you and, and um, also thank the um, CAPOS team and, and hand it over to Dr. Lim um, for his um, um, comments and, 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 and let, let him start the webinar finally, right? So thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's my honor to speak a welcome remark as a president of Korean Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, KPOS. Thanks for Dr. Faruk Orgi, Dr. Jason Yam, and Dr. Po Young John to have this webinar hosted by AAO with IPOSC and KAPOS. KAPOS was founded at 1985. Now the number of members are about 150. I wish all of you have a good time to discuss about intermittent exotropia today. Thank you very much. That's all. <laughs> so. With that, we'll hand over to our lovely moderators to, to moderate the session. And um, ju just as a reminder, if you have any questions, uh, um, please uh, direct your questions through the Q&A. And the, the panel, as well as the, uh, the speakers, will be monitoring these. And, and, and um, thank you again for all. Now, now it's all you, the moderators. Thank you. Hello, everyone. 
Thank you for inviting me as a moderator of the IPOSC KPOS webinar. I am honored to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Dani Su, USA. Dani is a professor of ophthalmology at Gavin Herbert Eye Institute, chief of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at University of California, Irving, and works at Orbis International. He's talking a randomized trial evaluating on and off treatment effectiveness of over minor spectaculars in children three to 10 years of age with intermittent exotropia. Danny, please start. Thank you. I'm going to share my slides now. Let's see. Can I, um, uh, can I share my slides, Dan? Oh, perfect. Perfect. Just a second, I apologize. I'm gonna share my slides. Can you see my, you cannot see my slides, right? Can you see, see my slides? Yes, we, we can, can see, see them. them. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, I'll be talking on the um, I'll be talking on the randomized control uh, study uh, trial evaluating over minus treatment effectiveness in children three to ten years of age. And first, I would like to thank the uh, planning committee for inviting me, and um, it's truly a great honor to uh, to uh, give a talk before. IPOSC and also KPOSC. And first up, before I start, I would like to thank our um, Pediatric Eye Disease Investigator Group members and also the writing committee for um, making this uh, study possible. And none of our authors have any financial interests or relationships to disclose. Uh, first, before I start, uh, as we know, the over lens therapy for intermittent exotropia has been used uh, as a non-surgical treatment and it's uh, typically used as a temporary treatment to improve control before surgery, or sometimes it can be used as a long-term intervention with intention of weaning the, the glasses off over time. And initially, back about uh, five years ago, we have performed a, a small pilot randomized control trial, and we found that the, the distance control uh, improved only after eight weeks. So we actually started a larger um, uh, uh, study uh, to assess two things. One, initially, uh, we wanted to look at the, the control, like uh, the, um, of the intermittent exotropia with 12 months of on treatment with the over minus lenses. And second was that after you discontin discontinue the treatment, we wanted to see what actually happens, like is the control remains or is it uh, dissipates? And then when we talk about the distance intermittent exotropia control, we measured three consecutive times and we, we took the mean of the three measurements. And this is the control scale that we had used from zero to five. Zero being the a small phoria that's very well controlled, five being poor control with a constant exotropia with the one, two, three, and four somewhere in between. The major eligible criteria was between the age of three to 11 years of age. Uh, the control was moderate to poor with the exotropia from 15 prison doctors or greater. Um, and then no previous Christmas surgeries, of course, and no previous uh, over minus um, treatment. And the spherical equivalence was between plus one to minus six diopters in the least hyperopic eye. And once they were enrolled, uh, they were randomized into over minus spectacles or non over minus spectacles. And if they were enrolled into the over minus spectacles, they were given minus 2.5 diopters added to the sphere for the over minus correction. And they were followed at six months, then again at 12 months. And then at 12 months, that 2.5 diopters was reduced to 1.25 diopters. And then they were wearing those glasses for three more months. And then it was completely weaned off. So they were all on off treatment. And then three months later, we 
measure the off-treatment outcome of the controls. And fortunately, this, the uh, study visit completion was pretty good for both groups. And then also the compliance with spectacle wares at 12 months was also pretty good as well, uh, you know, between excellent to good in most of the patients. So what did the results show? First, uh, remember the control uh, prior to treatment was about 3.2 in both groups. Um, after we started the, uh, after the um, over minus correction, the over minus correction group was 1.8 uh, versus 2.8, which was similar to prior to treatment, of course, with the non over minus group. So the difference was statistically significant. And then what happened after the glasses were weaned off? That control of 1.8, 2.8, actually the difference dissipated and it actually increased to 2.4 to 2.7. And the, that difference was not statistically significant. So most of the impact from the over minus correction dissipated, unfortunately. But what was concerning was the change in their refractive error at 12 months. Um, as you can see with the over minus correction, after just one year, there was a mean myopic uh, progression of 0.42 diopters versus in a non over minus group, was, which was practically zero. That difference of 0.38 diopters was statistically significant. And if you look at the proportion of children having more than one diopter of myopic shift, it was actually 17% of the over minus group versus just 1%. So this was pretty alarming. But what was even more alarming is that the change in refractive error for those patients who had baseline myopic correction already. So before they were enrolled into the study, if they had myopia already of minus six doctors to 0.5 doctors, then, um, then the, in the over minus group, there was a progression mean of 1.07 diopters versus 0.06. So that difference is actually 0.84 diopters. And of course it was statistically significant. But for those patients who are non-myopic, it means they were either emetropic or hyperopic, that difference was much smaller at 0.3 diopters, but it was still significant. So if you look at the proportion of children having one, more than one diopter of myopic shift in the non-myopic or myopic group prior to treatment, this is what we found. 8% of the patients who are not myopic would progress to develop significant myopic shift of one diopter or greater versus virtually zero. But if they had myopia, prior to treatment, that chance went up to 51%. So there was a 51% chance that you would develop one diopter or more of myopic shift if you had baseline myopia versus only 2% in the non-myopic uh, baseline, uh, non-myopic group. Now, so in conclusion, uh, what we found is that over minus lens treatment, there is a definite role for it. It improves a distant intermittent exotropia control over 12 months, but the treatment effect is not retained. And it, uh, once that the intermittent, once the myopic over minus correction was discontinued. Second, before considering over minus as a potential treatment to improve control, the risk of increased myopia should be discussed with parents. And the, especially those patients who are already myopic. But you have before, uh, before we make any conclusions that the, these are things that you have to consider. The findings are generalizable only to children between three to 10 years of age with similar clinical characteristics with the refractive errors of plus one to minus six factors. And also remember, we over minus our patients by 2.5 factors. So we don't really know what type of impact that this would have if the over minus correction was less or even greater. And, um, the, and also we weaned out these patients over three months period. So again, if the weaning period was different, it, the result may have 
result may actually be different. And also, lastly, the long-term effect of Overman is uh, on myopic shift is still unknown and it's still under investigations. And hopefully we get to uh, uh, present this to you next time we meet again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Su. Uh, are there any questions coming to from the audience? Oh yes, here are some questions. Dr. Su, do you recommend prescribing over minus lenses and atropine eye drops in patients with intermittent exotropia and myopia? How about this? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, I, I do actually um, use atropine for intermittent exotropia uh, patients, um, and and um, uh, but. In terms of the recommendations, um, it, uh, prescribing over minus correction with atropine is probably a safer way, uh, but unfortunately we don't have any data to substantiate that. So at this point, I'm gonna say, you know, I'm not sure if that's something that I would recommend, but I'm gonna tell you after this particular study, study I'm a lot more leery about prescribing uh, over minus um, correction for intermittent exotropia in any form, even with a combination of atropine. Thank you. And there is another one. How is the percentage of patients experiencing near blurred with this over minus correction? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? I'm sorry, you know what, I should try to read this. Uh, can you repeat that question again? Uh, how is the percentage of patients experience near blurring Oh, sure, sure. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, uh, you know, with the uh, commented amplitude in pediatric patients, that can be up to about 10 diopters, uh, they typically do not have any difficulties. And I actually had, uh, I actually um, had many patients in this particular study. And, um, and that was one of the concerns that I did have. Um, but as you can see, the compliance uh, with the glasses was excellent in both, actually both groups. Um, and, um, and so, uh, the, the, the benefit of better control of exotropia, I think probably benefited the pediatric patients and they, they actually liked it. So they weren't really, uh, I, really I really didn't have met, uh, many patients who actually com uh, complained about uh, blur with just 2.5 adapters. So the benefit outweighed the, the, the potential discomfort of a uh, slight blur. Thank you. We have more questions, but we have time. So uh, let me move to the next uh, speaker. Yeah, and, would, uh, and if we have a time, we can come back to the questions. Thank you very I much. The answers on the, on the uh, response. Okay. Mm -hmm. The next speaker is Rosario Gomez de Liano from Spain. She's well known as a president of the ISCA, also an ex-president of ESCA. She's going to talk about use of Botox in management of intermittent exotropia. Good morning. I thank both IPOS and KPOS for having me here. And the objective of my talk is the use of botulinum toxin injection in the treatment of intermittent exotropia that, although it's not very frequent use, it is a very interesting technique to remember for certain situations. I have no conflict of interest. Botulinum toxin is less frequently used than isotropia because it corrects less amount of strabismus. But on the other hand, surgical treatments in intermittent exotropia have high recurrency rate and multiple surgeries are often required to achieve a desirable motor outcome. So we are going to see in this talk how we can occasionally use botulinum toxin in the treatment of intermittent exotropia. And it seems to me that it can be considered as a first line action in patients with consecutive isotropia and as well in some other uses for isotropias that they are not the objective of the talk of today. About the effect of botulinum toxin, many years ago we described the evolution curve 
of the deviation after botulinum toxin injection, in which we can consider that we can we obtain a stabilization of the motor lightning between nine months and one year, and concluded that Botox corrects an average of 25 diopters in isotropias and 15 in exotropias. And in other series, we evaluate factors that influence the result that were by side the type of strabismus as said before, age, the degree of deviation, the potential of binocularity, and other factors, but especially technical factors. That means the degree of paralysis. The first series were published uh, by Alan Scott, in which he obtained 93% of good results in terms of motor alignment, and one third of their patients obtained full steropsis. We did a study some years after in which we saw that we could obtain 50 diopters of reduction of the deviation with an average of 12 months, 38% of our patients were aligned, but five years after, two out of 18 patients only avoided the surgery, which changed our perspective in the use of uh, botulinum toxin intermittent exotropia. But we saw that our patients were aligned for a period of 9 to 12 months that at that age of 2 or 3 years could be very interesting, that gave a high satisfaction but also allowed the possibility to some of them to begin to fuse. And then other series appeared with different uh, motor lines. The group of Lee uh, demonstrated that better results were obtained in patients having certain potential of binocularity. Michigera posteriorly uh, divided the results depending on the subtype of intermittent exotropy, and he saw that the worst results were obtained in convergence insufficiency intermittent exotropy. In order to analyze the effect on the different subtypes of intermittent exotropia, I took a small series retrospectively for this webinar and analyzed the effect in the different types of intermittent exotropia and in our hands, the better results and the larger correction was obtained in the divergence excess subtype and the worse, as Vinci Guerra said, in the convergence insufficiency type. Other aspects to point out is the evaluation of the Newcastle score after the injection, as pointed out in 2014, and uh, in 2018, the combination of visual therapy first and then botulinum toxin for patients that they are not aligned with visual th therapy, in which in this paper they obtain a really high success combining both techniques. And finally, another paper from our group in which we evaluated uh, surgery after botulinum toxin injection or surgery alone. This study had a bias because the patients that obviously had Botox had much larger deviations before the injection and they were much more decompensated. But the good thing that they using similar surgeries we obtained quite similar results in terms of motor alignment. But why it is different? It is postulated that the higher success rate of visual rectus injections may be due to greater concentration of globally layered single innervated fibers, which are singly and profoundly affected by botulinum toxin injection. But there are other factors as the binocularity or technical factors as it is in those patients who obtain much less degree of paralysis, smaller cover overcorrection, for instance, it's very, very rare to have over 30 diopters of isotropia after injections on the laterals, while that is very frequent to obtain very large overcorrections in isotropias. And only along the years in our groups, we have seen one patient with a consecutive isotropia after botulinum toxin injection, and although it's not very frequent also to overcorrect isotropias, but 
you may see them now and then. So seeing those results, does it have still a role in the, in the management of intermittent metrotropia? I think that in very special cases, for instance, like this girl, that she's very decompensated at distance, and because of the age and other factors, you don't want to operate her. And with the Botox, we may align them, maybe for one year, which gives high satisfaction and gives them an opportunity to fuse and the later surgery, maybe one or two years, and then you can do a surgery as seen in this slide. Or, or this other girl, which is one of those unfrequent cases that may be aligned for several years with very high quality of life and being able to fuse. But as said before, most of our patients will go for surgery. Botulinum toxin is a very useful treatment for the management of consecutive isotropia after surgery for intermittent exotropia. Consecutive isotropia can be since the beginning, but also we may have late overcorrections cases. We evaluate the cause of the consecutive isotropia and we will proceed with other treatments that I will not develop here because I would like to overlap the talk of Dr. Rui that will be at the very end of this webinar. But for me, botulinum toxin is the first line treatment before surgery unless we suspect a slippage of the lateral rectus. In this type of strabismus, most authors have had great success with very low risk of recurrence of the exodeviation. And it's, what it is very in, interesting that is that we obtain improvement of the monocular vision even in patients with large duration of the isotropia. In our study, most of our patients improved just with one bilateral injection, but we had over life other patients that they were not included in this study, mainly adults, that we did not have the same results as with children. And in a recent paper uh, in which it was evaluated a very large series of patients with consecutive isotropia. They obtained better results in patients having deviations up to 18 diopters and patients treated within one month after the injection. But we have to say that many other papers also had had very good results treated deviations up to 35 to 40 diopters and also with a delay to the injection. So to summarize, botulinum toxin may be a first line treatment in the management of consecutive isotropia after surgery for intermittent uh, exotropia. Unless a slippage is suspected, I think it's very interesting, especially in children, but also in adults when they are seeing double after one month of the surgery and that they are not improving with crisps. In the series published, no recurrence of the exotropia is obtained after the in injection. And the delay to the botulinum toxin was not an impediment to the success with uh, this injection. Thank you, Rosario. I hear a question from the audience. Uh, how many prism diopters do you offer Botox to your patients? And do you use EMG guidance? For small children, do you do under general anesthesia? Mm, well, thank you very much. And I'm very sorry for the sound issue because in my computer, I could see it hear it properly. Well, um, I would like to say you that from 10 patients that we have with intermittent exotropia, mostly they are treated with medical treatments, some with surgery and Botox, it is used 
only in very, very rare cases. Uh, when I use, usually there were children with extremely large deviations because when they have smaller ones, they don't need anything. You can wait until surgery. So many of our children had over 30 diopters because the main issue was to have a child age two that he is almost constantly squinting to try them not to have them for two years with a constant squint if you cannot do anything with any other uh, alternative methods. So large deviations are my indications, although they are not very frequent. Do you use EMG guidance? Yes, I use it. Although you can inject the lateral rectus using a Mendoza forceps that you can just grasp the muscle and, and inject it in it. And I do it, yes, with the general anesthesia in the children. Because, you know, you are too close from the macula. So I, I wouldn't do it with um, any trite of forcement of those children. Thank you. I have one question to you. Do you change the amount of Botox on cases after uh, surgery? I mean, consecutive isotropia patients. Same amount with the original isotropia patients? Uh, yes, in, uh, in intermittent exotropia, I use large doses, but in consecutive isotropia after intermittent exotropia surgery, uh, half of the patients were 2.5 and half of the patients were five. And if I don't have a too large deviation, I will use low doses. It's a very good question. Thank you. Yes, here the same question came. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So let's move to the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Heng Jin Lee from Korea. Dr. Heng Jin Lee, is an assistant professor, Department of Ophthalmology, Chumpok National University Hospital. She's going to talk about medial rectus multiplication in intermittent exotropy. Please start. Good evening, everyone. It's very honor to be here and thank you Sound stopped. Good evening, everyone. It's very honor to be here and thank you for having me in this beautiful session. The surgical treatment for intermittent exotropia is important, though non-surgical modalities can be considered in some cases. Patients should be followed over time to determine whether their exotropia is stable or deteriorating. I am deciding on the surgery, especially if there are the following signs of progression. After deciding on surgery, we should consider these factors when planning. Actually, there are a number of things to consider. This is a paper published in 2018. The same surgical amount was performed on patients with the same angle, about 30 prism diopters. As a result, the presence of letter incomitance was related to the surgical success and to achieve a favorable outcome targeting the post-operative of a correction more than 10 prism diopter after one week was needed in this study. As you well know, the choice of surgical method is important. We have to measure the distance and near deviation angle, and the types of exotropia should be considered as well. Briefly, I am going to talk about BRR recession and RNR, which are the most representative surgical methods in exotropia. 
Some prefer BRR recession and others prefer RNR. There have been many studies on the comparison of BRR and RNR. Previously, Dr. Kushiner's findings were as follows. However, the procedure of choice for exotropia is still controversial and is mostly based on individual surgeon's experience. There was a report that surgical outcomes by two years after surgery for intermittent exotropia were not different between the BRR and RNR. However, finer outcomes were better in the BRR group. Authors stated that the initial tethering effect secondary to MR resection results in initial success. However, a gradual loss of vision leads to subsequent exotrift. And the long-standing tension on the resected medial rectus causes muscle stretching resulting in a decrease in the tethering effect. According to a meta-analysis, RNR procedure is associated with a higher success rate and lower recurrence rates than BRR procedure. There were no differences in the overcorrection rates between the two groups. Petty reported that there was no significant difference between BRR and RNR. However, it should be noted that the reoperation after 3 years was 10% in the BRR and 5% in the RNR group. And the most of BRR group had a recurrence and RNR had of a correction, which means that the characteristics of the patients who underwent reoperation were different. Since BRR and RNR are different surgeries, a longer term study is essential. Tightening of the EOM commonly involves resection, tucking, and plication. Resection techniques are all familiar. It removes a part of the muscle which has chances of slipped or lost muscle and cuts some vessels which increases the risk of anterior segment ischemia. Tucking procedure sutures muscle to muscle and this tuck could be relaxed over time. Plication procedure was first described by Dr. Wright in 1991, called modified rectus tuck. This modification involved suturing muscle to the sclera. It offers several advantages of a resection, including reversibility and potentially less disruption of ciliary arteries, which means a less invasive procedure compared to resection. Since multiplication does not require any disinsertion of the EOM, it has no risk of slit or lost muscles. So plication is a tightening procedure in which the muscle is folded and sutured to the sclera at the muscle insertion. Briefly, the muscle is hooked and connective tissue bluntly dissected posteriorly. Two sutures are passed at the desired application distance from the insertion site, and the sutures are then passed partial thickness through the sclera at the corresponding pores of the muscle insertion. Here you can see the iris spatula. Uh, it could be placed between the tendon and the sutures to fold the anterior tendon under the muscle. It is called fold under technique, like this. Differently, some surgeons leave the plicated muscle on the surface, like this picture, believing that there is less manipulation and possibly less chance of compromising circulation than the forward under technique. This folding method can be decided according to the surgeon's preference. However, what's important here is that the sclera passes should be deep enough that will they will support the muscle when it's advanced. So it is quite different from the classic tucking. Anterior segment ischemia is a rare but potentially serious complication of strabismus surgery. This is an iris angiogram showing filling defect after superior rectus muscle recession 
and this shows no filling defect after inferior rectus muscle application. There have been several studies on the effect of application. Previous study has shown has been shown to have a similar surgical effect between resection and plication. However, some reported that plication is less effective compared to resection. We compare the BAR and RNR groups respectively after performing plication instead of resection. First, we compare the surgical outcome between RNR and RNP. The angle of extra deviation steadily increased over time in both groups after surgery, and the duration of extra drift were longer in the RNP. Finally, the RNR group presented better surgical outcomes than RNP. The amount of initial overcorrection was important. Patients um, more than 10% diopter is a deviation after one month tends to achieve a better surgical outcome in this study group. In patients with basic type, the angle of extra deviation of the RMP steadily increased over time after surgery. The BRR showed an early extra drift here and a more stable course compared to the RMP group. And establishing more extra deviation in the RMP was required to achieve successful surgical results. To increase success rate at final follow-up, augmenting the surgical dosage in the application is necessary. Based on previous studies, we could attain similar early postoperative results with RMP after augmenting the surgical dosage of 1.5 mm over the surgical amount of resection. And this is the surgical table. Because larger overcorrection could lead to the consecutive isotropia requiring reoperation, targeting the appropriate iso deviation must be performed with consideration for both overcorrection and recurrence. Miniplication for rectus muscles in small angle strabismus is described by Dr. Wright. This involves using suture applied to the central fibers of the muscle here and 5 mm posterior to the insertion and then pass through the sclera just anterior to the muscle insertion to placate the central portion of the muscle. Thus, compared to the standard procedure, this did not involve placating the anterior, entire muscle tendon. And according to this study, mini placation reduced vertical and horizontal deviation on average of 6 prism diopters. A horizontal rectus multiplication may be combined with vertical transposition. The inferior muscle suture, white arrow, is passed through the sclera anterior to the spear pole of the muscle edge. And the spear muscle suture, black arrow, is passed through the sclera wonderful tendon width about 7 mm, spear to the first sclera path. This results in a triangular fold in the muscle. They reported that up to 15 prism diopters of vertical deviation can be corrected with a full tendon width transposition of both the recessed and placated muscle. Another group has recently reported the results of the transposition calling sliding shape UM transposition. I feel that intermittent exotropia surgery is more difficult after experiencing various results than when I first started. There are many things to consider. However, good results can be obtained if we find out the characteristics of each patient well, examine and operate them carefully. Lastly, in a meta-analysis, it was found that both procedures showed similar results which means that application and resection are not significantly different. Our study was also included in here, and it can be seen that the success rate is relatively low because of longer follow-up than other studies. Resection and application are quite similar procedures 
So plication could be considered as an alternative for tightening rectus muscles in strabismus surgery. It's important to perform the surgery properly and to set the surgical amount of plication well and to target an appropriate angle of deviation after surgery when planning the plication. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, here are some questions uh, from Vinita Singh. Uh, what are the factors which you use to choose between resection and pl plication? Uh, thank you, doctor. Thank you for your precious comment. Um, when RNR is performed one, one eye in intermittent exotropia, then RMP could be considered the contralateral eye to preserve anterior circulation. And actually the data I presented in my presentation video was from my mentor, Sung Jun Kim. So he is now preferred application as the primary surgery in intermittent exotropia based on of many advantages as I presented before. And, in addition, if we have to perform the reoperation, then we could try the application to preserve the circulation as well. Thank you. And another question is, have you ever tried application from vertical muscles, uh, such as for thyroid of thalmopathy? Oh, yeah, thank you for your comment. Um, actually, I think that the determination of the surgical dosage of the application is quite difficult. Actually, before publishing papers, uh, my mentor has been using plication for the past six years. And when we just started plication, we noticed that there are more frequent reoperation among patients who underwent plication compared to resection. So we have to slightly increase the surgical dosage by um, 0.5 millimeter at an interval of three months. And after augmenting the surgical dosage, 1.5 millimeters over the original surgical formula, then we could attain the similar results. So uh, the answer is no, I have not uh, experienced the uh, plication in the vertical rectus muscle, but when planning the plication in the vertical rectus muscle, then we have to think about the surgical dosage and the target angle. Thank you for your good comments. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have one question. What is uh, uh, the largest dosage to perform application of medial rectus muscle? Uh, we just do the um, seven point millimeters. And oh. Yes, um, it, uh, it was um, um, depending on the near target angle of deviation. And when it angle is of 35 the prism diopters, then we perform the seven dot millimeters. And that is the maximum dosage for the application in the uh, medial rectus muscles. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There are many, uh, many other questions. So please answer. Uh, later. Okay. okay, thank you. So now it's time to pass the moderator to Dr. Zhong Min Huang. Zhong Min, please. Hello, colleagues. I'm Zhong Min Huang from Korea. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy to introduce Dr. Mio Sato. She is a professor in Hamamatsu University in Japan and the president of Japanese Association for Strabismus and Amblyopia. She has taught us with so many lectures and articles. She will talk about the trends of intermittent exotropia management in Japan 2022. Mio, please. Hi, I'm Miho Sato, talking from Japan. I'm going to talk about the trend of intermittent exotropia management in Japan. The purpose of this small survey was to know how Japanese strabismologists manage intermittent exotropia currently. I performed a survey to Japanese strabismologists using a non live program, Survey Monkey during January 11th to 17th, 2022. The survey included 36 questionnaires. During the short time period, 81 ophthalmologists replied. Here are backgrounds of the repliers. 
Most of them have a career of strip business management more than 10 years, but some of them are still under training. 70% of responders are operating more than 20 cases per year, including teaching cases. Pediatric Eye Disease Investigator Group is well known by Japanese ophthalmologists. The highest were the people with a career of three to five years, and the lowest were the people less than three years of career. Although not all the people know about PEDIC, many people are influenced by their research result. Before going to the survey results, I would like to present some recent articles published by Japanese doctors. Dr. Koseki and Ishikawa collected the data of 1,214 office workers. The average angle at near was 8.1 prism diopters, and 3.6% of people were exotropic. Exotropia was 18 times more common compared to isotropia at near. The average angle at distance was 3.9 prism diopters and 1.7% people were exotropic. Exotropia was seven times more common to isotropia at distance. They concluded that convergence insufficiency type of exotropia was very popular in Japanese adult. Dr. Fujikado and his group measured refraction change during monocular viewing and binocular viewing on different age groups with intermittent exotropy. They showed that the patients older than 20 years old showed a significant myopic shift during binocular viewing. This finding suggests young adult patients with intermittent exotropy often feel difficulty in binocular seeing at distance because of excess accommodation for fusion. The excess use of a smartphone is an important issue of strabismus. It may influence patients with intermittent exotropia. Dr. Hirota and Fujikado recorded eye movement of patients with intermittent exotropia during smartphone reading at different distance using video geography. They found that many people with intermittent exotropia were seeing smartphone monocularly especially at 20 centimeters, more than 40% of the people were seen monocularly. Here is the multi-center study of surgical results in Japan. From six hospitals, 377 patients who underwent the first surgery of unilateral R&R &R followed more than three years were collected. The definition of a cure was between minus 15 prism diopters to 10 prism diopters. Age at surgery was 6.7 years, and preoperative deviation was 31.6 prism diopters. Preoperative deviation of less than 30 prism diopters and one week postoperative ESO deviation was significantly related to the cure. How about the age of operation? Dr. Hamasaki reported the stability and the amount of postoperative X drift with age after unilateral R and R surgery. He found the postoperative X drift was smaller in adults compared to the age younger than 19 years old. Let's go to the survey result. Questions included interest about intermittent exotropia management, non-surgical treatment, prescribed glasses, surgical options, post-operative diplopia. What are Japanese strabismologists interested in about intermittent exotropia management? The top three answers were prevent recurrence, re-operation timing for recurrence, and timing for the first surgery. They are all, all related to undercorrections. Management of overcorrection and postoperative diplopia were not popular problem in Japan. 
In order to prevent recurrence, prism adaptation tests and prolonged monocular occlusion are often performed to induce the largest angle of strabismus, and then with the surgery to the older ages. Pre- and post-operative orthoptics are also performed. These are answered for non-surgical treatment for children and for adults. Almost 100 of doctors prescribe glasses, and they are not over minus. And the convergence exercise was popularly instructed for children, but for adults, it is quite small. In addition, daily life guidance is given to children. Botox injection is very rarely performed. The number may increase after this webinar. The border to prescribe glasses in children is over minus 0.75 of myopia or poorer than 0.7 decimal visual acuity in children. Many people are worrying about excess use of digital devices on intermittent exotropia. The influences are not direct, but such as insomnia, eye fatigue, physical and psychological problems. Myopia progress may be a concern, and in result, Fourier maintain becomes difficult and accommodation or convergence ability may decrease. Now let's move to surgery. To the basic type of adult intermittent exotropia, mostly non-dominant eye was operated, and some were doing bilateral surgeries. The middle rectus muscle application is not commonly performed, but there is a potential to do on 30% of people. The indication may be the issue. Fourier myopia is mostly treated with surgery. Adjustable procedure is not common in, in Japan for intermittent exotropia, but if the additional fee is introduced, it may be more commonly performed. The treatment option for convergence insufficiency type intermittent exotropia dispersed, but R on R on one eye was the most common, and the second was prisons. Divergence excess type intermittent exotropia was treated by lateral rectus muscle recession in most cases. And the second is prisons. The management for the cases with large difference between distant and near angle dispersed. There are many care and attention was paid for prevent post-operative diplopia. A single lateral rectus muscle recession was performed on cases with smaller than 30 prism diopters and most commonly less than 20 prism diopters. The post-operative angle for children was targeted small angle isotropia in most ophthalmologists in day one and gradually shifted to less isotropia. The post-operative angle for adults are less is isotropia than children. Many doctors aim to be orthophoria and try not to go for large isotropia. Because of the tendency, many Japanese ophthalmologists are not worrying over correction but under correction. When patients complain diplopia day one, most people do not do anything. But if it continues one week, prisms are prescribed, and when it continues one month, Something is done, including the explanation for reoperation. When it occurs in adults, prisms are prescribed on day one and mostly on day seven. In summary, recurrence of intermittent exotropy is the main concern for Japanese ophthalmologists. R and R and the lateral rectus muscle recession are both common procedures. Adjustable surgery and Botox injections are not popular. 
Excess use of digital devices may influence intermittent exotropia in combination of myopia progression and physical and mental stress. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your interesting lecture. Here comes a question. Uh, do you prescribe vision therapy for convergence insufficiency apart from surgery? Uh, yes, we. I, I prescribe a uh, pencil push-up type convergence exercise before and after the surgery. I think many doc ophthalmologists do uh, recommend this type of training. Yes, and another one is uh, near reading seems to be not effective since patients use only one eye. Do you think surgery might be mandatory in patients using only one eye for reading? Uh, near reading seems to be not. Well, I think surgery is uh, effective on those patients as well. Okay, and um, I have one question. Could you explain more about daily life guidance? Uh, especially for children, I uh, many ophthalmologists recommend sleep early and screen less screen type and having a good condition. That's the daily life guidance. Thank you. And in your lecture, exotropia is 18 times more common than isotropia near and seven times more at distance. What seems to be the reason for the difference according to the distance? Well, it's, uh, there is no uh, uh, perfect answer, but I think aging is uh, key to reduce the, the convergence if power. So then the people is shifting to convergence insufficiency type of exotropia in adult. And we have one more question. Is the effect of push-up different from the long use of phone in improving convergence insufficiency? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know yet. Maybe, yes, maybe not. Because uh, for a long time using phone, uh, may be seeing the monocularly and disrupt the fusion. So maybe, yes, maybe not. I'm not sure. Oh, thank you very much. I think we had better move on to the next topic. The next speaker, Dr. John Boyong, is a professor and the chief of ophthalmology department at Gyeongbu National University in Korea. She has prepared this webinar as a director of international communication of COPUS. She will talk about intermittent exotropia with convergence insufficiency. Dr. John, please. Thank you. I'm honored to have been provided this opportunity to participate in this joint webinar. Today, I will be discussing intermittent exotropia with convergence insufficiency. I have no financial interest or relationships to disclose. The term convergence insufficiency has been used in the literature to describe two different disease entities. Patients with convergence insufficiency have decreased fusional convergence amplitudes, a remote near point of convergence, and display symptoms of asthenopia, which includes headache and diplopia. Typically, these patients present no deviation at distance and only present small to moderate exodeviation at near. These patients have been found to respond well with orthoptic exercises. 
When compared to convergence insufficiency, intermittent exotropia with convergence insufficiency is an entirely different disease entity. It is defined as having a greater exodeviation at near fixation than at distance by at least 10 percent diopters, which occurs in only 1.2% to 7.8% of all intermittent exotropia cases. It is associated with a normal near point of convergence. These patients display small to moderate exodeviation at distance and large exodeviation at near. Their accommodative convergence to accommodation ratio is low to all means of testing. Monocular occlusion does not increase exodeviation at distance and they respond poorly to orthoptic exercises. According to Yang and Huang's study, intermittent exotropia with convergence insufficiency can be categorized into three subgroups after diagnostic monocular occlusion. True CI group is defined as having near-distance disparity of 10% diopters or more before and after occlusion. Masked CI group is defined as having near-distance disparity of less than 10% diopters before occlusion, and it increases to 10 prism diopters or more after occlusion. In other words, some patients with basic type intermittent exotropia may exhibit an increased exodeviation at near after diagnostic monocular occlusion, resulting in the conversion to convergence insufficiency type intermittent exotropia. Pseudo-CI group is defined as having near-distance disparity of 10 percent diopters or more before occlusion, but it decreases to less than 10 percent diopters after occlusion. Non-surgical treatments such as pencil push-ups or vision therapy may relieve symptoms including headache, diplopia, blurred vision, and reading problems. However, strabism surgery is often required to prevent loss of binocular vision in patients who do not respond to non-surgical treatments. There have been various surgical procedures introduced for intermittent exotropia with convergence insufficiency. Depending on the surgical method, success rates varied between 18 and 92 percent, with most cases having unsatisfactory results. Some patients often experience the limitation of abduction or postoperative diplopia. Conventional bilateral lateral rectus recession with adjustable suture was introduced by Ma and Cliques. The surgical doses for the lateral rectus muscle recession were calculated based on the measurements of the maximum exodeviations at distance. Bilateral lateral rectus recession with adjustable sutures successfully reduced near and distant exodeviations and near distant disparity as well. 84% of patients obtained surgical success in their study. Choi and Huang introduced improved resection and resection procedure. The amount of resection and resection were based on near and distance deviation respectively. Improved resection and resection successfully reduced near and distant exodeviations and near distance disparity as well. 43% of the patients obtained surgical success in their study. Yang and Huang compared surgical outcomes of augmented bilateral lateral rectus recession and improved recession and resection procedures in their study. The bilateral lateral rectus recession procedures was based on near deviation with 1 mm augmentation. The amount of resection and recession were based on near and distance deviation, respectively. They concluded that improved recession and resection procedure was significantly more successful than bilateral lateral rectus recession procedure in the true CI and masked CI groups. Choi and Huang introduced slanted bilateral middle rectus resection. 
During slanted middle rectus resection, the upper edge of the middle rectus was resected according to the distance exodeviation, and the lower edge of the middle rectus was resected according to near deviation. Bilateral slanted middle rectus resection resulted in undercorrection in all patients in this study. Wang and Cleeks compared surgical outcomes of bilateral middle rectus plication and bilateral middle rectus resection. The middle rectus strengthening dosage was based on the largest distance exodeviation. Middle rectus plication and middle rectus resection were performed at the same surgical dosage in this study. Six months after surgery, it was reported that there had been no differences in neither deviations nor surgical success rates between the two groups. However, bilateral middle rectus application group demonstrated a less immediate postoperative overcorrection and shorter operative time than bilateral middle rectus resection group. Wang and Cleeks compared surgical outcomes of unilateral middle rectus resection, bilateral middle rectus resection, and improved recession and resection. In the unilateral middle rectus resection and bi bilateral middle rectus resection groups, the middle rectus resections were based on the distance exodeviation. In the unilateral recession and resection group, middle rectus resection was based on the near exodeviation, and lateral rectus recession was based on distance exodeviation. The success rate in the improved recession and resection group was significantly higher than those in the unilateral middle rectus resection group and bilateral middle rectus resection group. The surgical method that produced a 92% success rate in 12 patients one year after their surgery was introduced by Sneer and Cleeks. This method of surgery was a slanted bilateral lateral rectus recession, and it proved to display the best success rate ever. During this procedure, the upper pole of the lateral rectus muscle is recessed according to the distant deviation angle, and the lower pole of the lateral rectus muscle is recessed according to the near deviation angle, thus creating a new and oblique insertion, contrasting the original insertion. Therefore, the impact on the near exodeviation was much greater than the impact on the distance exodeviation. Slanted bilateral lateral rectus recession is my favorite surgical procedure for intermittent exotropia with convergence insufficiency. These are my early results of slanted bilateral lateral rectus recession in children. This procedure successfully reduced exodeviations at near and distance and near distance disparity as well. A successful outcome was obtained in 84% patients at six months after surgery. In this photo, you can see a newly made oblique insertion after slanted recession of the lateral rectus muscle. This is my recent work where I compared surgical outcomes of slanted bilateral lateral rectus recession for intermittent exotropia with convergence insufficiency according to their response to preoperative monocular occlusion. Slanted bilateral lateral rectus recession successfully reduced exodeviations at near and distance and reduced mean near distance disparity from 11 prism diopters to 1 prism diopter at 3 years after surgery. Cumulative probabilities of surgical success was 76% and the mean recurrence time was 50 months at 3 years after surgery. True CI and Master CI group showed a cumulative success rate of 89% and 55% respectively. I concluded that patients in the true CI group showed superior surgical outcomes than those in the masked CI group. Therefore, I would like to recommend slanted bilateral lateral rectus recession for the true CI group. 
for the patient in the masked CI group, improved recession and resection will work effectively. Farid and Cleeks compare surgical outcomes of slanted bilateral lateral rectus recession, improved RNR, and augmented bilateral lateral rectus recession. They reported that the surgical success rates were statistically indifferent among these three groups. However, vertical pattern strabismus was a feature of the slanted bilateral lateral rectus recession group whereas the rate of the post-operative overcorrection and undercorrection was significant in the augmented bilateral lateral rectus recession group and improved RNR group respectively. In closing, this slide is what I would like to the audience to take away from my presentation. Intermittent exotropia with convergence insufficiency is a rare form of intermittent exotropia and it is defined as having a greater exodeviation at near fixation than at distance by 10% diopters or more. Surgical options for treatment of intermittent exotropia with convergence insufficiency are highly controversial. In the literature review, improved recession and resection and slanted bilateral lateral rectus recession procedures achieved relatively higher success rates in correction of distance near deviations and near distance disparity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. Let me introduce, uh, let me ask you a quick question. In your recent study, true CI group demonstrate better surgical outcome than masked CI group. Could you explain why? Thank you for your question. I think patient in the masked CI group might have used their fusional convergence to decrease their exodeviation at near, but after surgery, the near uh, distance disparity might be collapsed after surgery, and then um, they will not use uh, that convert uh, that fusional convergence anymore. So uh, it will decrease the necessity of using that fusion of convergence and that will lead to um, increase of exo drift after the surgery and lead to early recurrence as well. Thank you. And here is one question. And how many millimeter do you put posteriorly the inferior pool of lateral lactose suture? in relation to the superior suture in slanted recession? In slanted, so, yeah. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I always uh, recess superior pole according to the distance angle and recess inferior pole according to the near deviation angle. And the average of slanting is for me, it's like um, 1.5 five millimeters to two, two millimeters. And my highest uh, slanting was um, 2.5 millimeters, I guess. Thank you. And here is an interesting question. Uh, what should be the plan if distance deviation is full, only full and 25 and near? And how much should be the recession? Oh, that's very interesting question. Uh, the patient has so small uh, deviation at distance. So in this time, I would prefer non-surgical uh, procedures like um, pencil push-up procedures for um, decreased diplopia at near. And after uh, that, I will try uh, prism instead of surgery because the, the patient had so small extra deviation at distance. Okay, thank you. And we have uh, just one more question. Uh, how about bilateral media rectal resection for convergence insufficient CXT? I think it, that was included in your lecture, but could you explain uh, shortly about the question? 
Uh, you mean the slanted bilateral midirectus resection? Uh, he or she asked that bilateral midirectus resection for convergence insufficiency FT. I think it's not the slanted, just a, yeah. Um, okay, um, according to the paper which I, I read, uh, they um, resected um, middle rectus uh, according to the distance deviation angle to avoid their uh, post-operative diplopia and overcorrection. And it is the last question. Uh, in case of associated alphabetical pattern, how do you proceed the uh, slanting slanted recession? Uh, for patient with AV pattern strabismus, uh, I do not um, do the slanted recession. Instead of uh, slanting, I prefer half tendon transposition for AV pattern. And uh, luckily I never experienced AV service bus, uh, I mean AV pattern after the slanted bilateral rectus recession. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Zhang. Um, let's move on to the last topic, consecutive isotropia. Dr. Ryu Surina is an associate professor of Harlem University in Korea. Dongtan Sacred Heart Hospital in Korea. She is such a promising member of Carpus. Dr. Ryu, please. Hello everyone, I'm Selena Ryu, and today I would like to talk about consecutive isotropia. When I was first asked to have this talk, I was impressed by the effort everyone was taking to keep on doing academic activities during the COVID pandemic. I have been living like a caveman since the pandemic, so I really appreciate all councils for giving me an opportunity for this talk. Today, my talk will mainly focus on the risk factors of consecutive isotropia and introduce related studies that were published during the past two years. The amount varies, but generally, consecutive isotropia is defined as isotropia of 10 or more prism diopters that appears following the development of exotropia. It can occur spontaneously or present after surgical treatment of exotropia. It is different from initial surgical overcorrection, and although the duration differs by surgeons, when initial postoperative isotropia persists for more than one month, it should be regarded as consecutive isotropia. The estimated incidence of consecutive isotropia is reported to vary between 6 and 20%. Small angle of initial postoperative isodeviation after exotropia surgery usually recovers to orthophoria within two weeks, so it can be observed without any treatments. As non-surgical options for management of consecutive isotropia, full correction of hyperopia, full-time or part-time patching, base out prism therapy can be applied to reduce overcorrection and maintain fusion. Hardesty reported that consecutive isotropia of less than 15 prism diopters can be cured with prism therapy alone. Bifocal glasses, topical anticholinesterase, and botulinum toxin can also be used. Reoperation to treat consecutive isotropia should be considered in instances of sustained consecutive isotropia above 14 prism diopters at distance, patients showing an increasing angle of isodeviation, and those with a limitation of lateral gaze six months after surgery. The reported surgical success rate of consecutive isotropia is high. I tried to review every paper that investigated factors associated with consecutive isotropia, and I apologize in advance if I missed anyone's study. I found several papers and some showed entirely opposite results. The definitions for the time the authors observed consecutive isotropia were all different, and limitations of the studies were retrospective design, non-randomized and uncontrolled structure, and small number of cases. So no study can really draw a conclusion on definitive risk factor for the incidence of consecutive isotropia. The factors mentioned are age at time of surgery, high ACA ratio, lateral incompetence, high myopia, 
amblyopia, porosclerosis, vertical deviation, type of esotopia, preoperative exodeviation amount, type of surgery that was done, duration from onset to surgery, and amount of initial overcorrection. I only put the studies that emphasize the factors that were not related with consecutive esotropia, so the number of studies might seem lower than actual publications. Now, I would like to introduce recent studies. In 2021, Ding published a study that evaluated patients with relatively more severe esodeviation who failed with non-surgical intervention and proceeded with a secondary surgery. They performed a case control match and various factors were examined for assessing the risk factors for the failure of non-surgical intervention. They subclassified the risk factors that previous studies had found related to consecutive esotropia. Various factors seem to be significant after univariate logistical analysis. However, after multivariate logistic analysis, age at the time of exotropia surgery and the type of surgery showed to be significantly correlated with the incidence of consecutive esotropia. Compared to patients of other age groups, the odds ratio was the highest in patients aged below 3 years old and the lowest in those aged between 3 to 6 years old. The odds ratio of participants with the age at surgery younger than 3 years old who developed consecutive esotropia was about tenfold higher than that from 3 to 6 years old, fivefold higher than the patients 10 years above. Compared to study subjects of other age groups, children aged 3 to 6 years old were shown to have relatively less risk for developing consecutive esotropia. The odds of surgical type with bilateral lateral rectus recession was around three times for the patients with lateral rectus recession combined with medial rectus resection. The next study is case reports of unreported complication of low-dose atropine-induced convergence excess esotropia due to hypoaccommodation following its application once at night. Patient 1 was a 6-year-old boy who underwent bilateral lateral rectus recession of 7.5 millimeters and inferior oblique weakening for basic type intermittent exotropia with Lee pattern. A year prior to starting LDA, developed esotropia following its use. His esotropia measured 18 prism diopters for distance and 35 for near that reduced to 14 prism diopters esophoria for distance and 16 for near after discontinuing low dose atropine. Patient 2 was a 6-year-old girl already on low-dose atropine underwent bilateral lateral rectus recession of 7.0 mm for intermittent exotropia with tenacious proximal fusion. She was orthotrophic for near and 8 prism diopters esotrophic for distance postoperatively. The low-dose atropine was discontinued on the day of surgery and resumed two weeks post-surgery. After one month, of following, she developed two prism diopters esotropia for distance and 25 for near that recovered to orthotropia after its discontinuation. Patient 3 was a 4-year-old girl using low-dose atropine for 3 months, underwent left eye lateral rectus resection of 7.5 mm and medial rectus resection of 5 mm with bilateral inferior oblique weakening for basic type intermittent exotropia with V pattern. Postoperatively, she had orthotropia for distance and 4 prism diopters esotropia for near. She resumed low dose atropine two weeks after surgery. One month later, she developed 12 prism diopters esotropia for distance and 25 for near. Three weeks after stopping low dose atropine, her near esotropia was reduced to 12 prism diopters and peripheral fusion was restored. Low dose atropine was effective in regarding the myopia progression in all the patients. Esotropia promptly normalized and the fusion was restored in all the children after discontinuation of low-dose atrophy. The authors described that bedtime installation of low-dose atrophy in the patients who were monofixators postoperatively resulted in hypoaccommodation induced excessive innervational drive to accommodate, leading to manifest esotropia with an increased ACA ratio, causing decompensation of their tenuous fusion. Hypoplegic agents interfere with accommodation, but if it is retained due to incomplete cycloplegia, it induces a reflex convergence by excessive innervation of accommodative effort, thus increasing esodeviation.
Conversely, if cycle budget is complete and present for an extended duration, accommodative efforts are suspended, causing complete abolition of an accommodative component of esotropia. Although none of the patients had convergence excess type of intermittent exotropia preoperatively, it is advisable to discontinue low-dose atrophy in such patients scheduled for strabismus surgery. In 2001, Ebeck reported clinical manifestations of delayed onset consecutive isotropia contrast to numerous previous studies that have investigated consecutive isotropia cases. Delayed onset consecutive isotropia was defined as patients who develop isodeviation after once recovering to orthotropia within one month after surgery for exotropia. Recently, the authors noticed an increase in patients who develop isodeviation after surgery, even after recovering to orthotropia. The cause of this increase was unknown, but an increase of near work in the current generation during the unstable postoperative period within several early months after surgery was thought to have played a role. As fewer patients with delayed onset isotropia required a second operation and responded well to conservative treatment, the prognosis of delayed onset consecutive isotropia was more favorable compared to that of continuous consecutive isotropia. Lastly, I will introduce a fresh study that was published this year of the longitudinal course of consecutive isotropia. The minimal required follow-up period after surgery was 24 months in patients who required reoperation within 24 months after the primary surgery were also included. A total of 336 patients were included. 236 were in the bilateral lateral rectus group and 100 in the RNR group. After surgery, post-operative isodeviation decreased mostly during the first post-operative month in both groups. Isodeviation at post-operative week 1 was observed in 64.9% and was considered immediate overcorrection after exotropia surgery. Afterwards, isodeviation tended to decrease. At post-operative year 2, there were 8.3% with consecutive isotropia, 6 in the RNR group and 22 in the bilateral lateral rectus group. In this study, most patients presented with immediate overcorrection in the initial post-operative period but showed a significant resolution at one month postoperatively. 13 patients showed delayed onset consecutive isotropia, and their mean maximal preoperative angle of exodeviation was significantly larger, and all patients except one underwent bilateral lateral rectus recession. The exact cause remains unclear. However, I think we will be seeing more patients with this condition as People today are doing much more near work with their smartphones and with everything else going on in this pandemic era. Therefore, it would be meaningful to further examine the clinical features of these patients who develop delayed onset consecutive isotropia. Once again, I thank all the committees for giving me this opportunity and also for everyone's attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Uh, just one quick question. I would like to ask your own experience of delayed onset consecutive isotropia. Um, can you uh, repeat the question? Sorry, I just wasn't able to catch it because I was like oh, typing sorry. another for- uh, I would like to ask your own experience Experience of delayed onset consecutive isotropia. So um, after the pandemic, I see that um, children are using their smartphones more and more for their online classes and almost doing all activities with their smartphones. And I do see that even the patients that were perfectly orthotrophic after one month start becoming isotrophic after like um, three months after surgery. So I do think this is a more interesting type of patients that we will see more and more. And um, hopefully there will be more studies about these patients. Oh, thank you, Dr. Liu. 
we, uh, we will run out of time and questions not taken for lack of time could be answered in writing. I would, I would like to thank all the speakers and audience. I deeply appreciate Carpus, IPOSC, and AAO for this webinar. Jason will make the final announcement for closing this webinar. Yes, Jason, colleagues please. and friends. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Zhongming and Miho, and I thank everyone for joining our webinar. And uh, this now to announce our next webinar, uh, because of the March, we are many of us are joining the APOS meeting, so we will skip the March and we will go to April. It will be uh, April 10th, uh, Sunday. Uh, this time, the topic will be the treatment approach on special strabismus. We are very honored for IPOS to partner with Mexico College this time. It's the Mexican Association of Pediatric. Uh, uh, of our homology. Uh, and uh, we have moderator from uh, Dr. Sonel uh, Fasafanti from Singapore and uh, Mario uh, Najara from Mexico. And we have speaker is uh, Dr. Louis Cardenas from Mexico on Brown syndrome, Dr. Fernando uh, Paris from Mexico on Mobile syndrome, and Dr. Mario Najara from Mexico on high myopia related strabismus. And we have Dr. Alejandro Amasto from Argentina on strabismus after retinal detachment surgery, and Agon Wang from Taiwan on thyroid strabismus, uh, and Rohit Sasena from India on Duane syndrome. So please do join us on this wonderful webinar on April 10th. Thank you so much to every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It was a wonderful session. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Sorry Thank you. for the delay. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you bye -bye. so much. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks again. And take care. <laughs> you too.